have any national security concerns with publishing the story. For more on the cyber conflict, let's hear from Catherine Waldron. She's a research associate of national security and cybersecurity at the R Street Institute. What do you think the U.S. is hoping to gain from this? And are we entering a new phase of cyber conflict with Russia? It's hard to say if we're entering a new phase of cyber conflict without knowing more details about the malware that was supposedly implemented in the Russian power grid, knowing how far they got um, into the system. I think what we can say is that the U.S. is clearly trying to we're still playing with the idea of deterrence. We're hoping to deter them. The Russians have been probing our power grids for years. Look, they've been probing our nuclear power plants. They've been uh, trying to probe utilities and critical systems, trying to find ways in. And now we are saying, hey, if you uh, launch an attack on us, we will do the same to you. Maybe you should think twice. So President Trump rejected the Times report. He called it a virtual act of treason. He also said, um, or the New York Times rather, in its report said that U.S. officials kept President Trump out of the loop on certain aspects of the plan. What do you think that says about uh, U.S. officials' relationship with the president? Do they trust him? So U.S. Cyber Command does have the authority legally to conduct these operations without consulting the president. That comes from a presidential memoranda that was passed last year, as well as last year's uh, NDAA, the National Defense um, Acquisition Act. But what is concerning is the president then tweeting out a response that directly contradicts um, statements by officials in the New York Times article. The concerning part is not that he was not consulted beforehand, but the reasons why he was not consulted beforehand as listed in this article, which is that they were worried he might countermand um, any activities they were pursuing. What is concerning to me is that we are not presenting a united front to the Russians. And that suggests that our foreign policy um, is weak and vulnerable. And what is the U.S. doing to prevent future cyber attacks or intrusions by the Russian government? So they've definitely stepped up their election security to some extent, but not to the extent that we should feel very secure. Some states have introduced their own policies looking to create state and local um, partnerships, bringing, relying on local cybersecurity experts to help bolster uh, resources that might be lacking. But not all states have done this. So Ohio has, Michigan has, and we can hope that partnerships like that is the way forward. But we need to address this at a national level. Catherine Waldron, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this with me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Of course, Russia isn't the only cyber threat. Take a look at the Hong Kong protests. The messaging service Telegram claims a cyber attack bogged down its platform with the alleged perpetrators mostly coming from IP addresses in China. Telegram, keep in mind, is an app used by protesters in Hong Kong, and those protesters accuse China of overreaching their authority in that controversial extradition bill. Time for a quick break. When we come back, a look at the history of Juneteenth and the ongoing reparations debate.